Today, the ambassador of possibility. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour and with a touch of philosophy on the side. It's my great pleasure to have Mark Victor Hansen on the show today. Uh, hello, Mark. Great to see you. Great to see you, Martin. Now, you have the uh, amazing record of 500 million books sold, Chicken Soup for the Soul, and you've written more recently about uh, wealth and about um, cash. But really, it's a question of motivation, isn't it? Totally. What I believe is that everyone's got to have self-determination to action. And that's why I write in what would is euphemistically, I guess, called the self-help action genre. And I've written 309 bestsellers and, and 59 times number one New York Times. So I think I'm holding most of the records, at least in America. I don't want to um, compare to anyone else. I don't know what's happening in Australia or anywhere else. Uh, so what is it about self-help and, and motivation? Why do you think it's just such a successful category? It's a critical, when I went bankrupt and back to 1974 and I wanted to cut my throat and end it all because I thought my self-worth and net worth were the same, I now know they're not, is it luckily I'd sold my way through graduate school and I had an audio tape and I listened to it. It gave me what Zig Ziglar would call a checkup from the neck up. And it reoriented my thinking instead of, oh, poor me, and I'm a victim. I said, hey, wait a second, I'm going to be a victor. I've got a destiny that is important. And, and um, it's going to sound unhumble and self-aggrandizing, but you know, my books have touched probably a billion plus people. And I, I couldn't be more thankful because the daily we get thousands of letters of, of people saying, it did this for me. It saved my life. It saved my marriage. It got me out of cancer or whatever it did, because, you know, I've done a very large uh, body of work. And under, underlying it all is, is this idea. It's all about attitude of mind and it's about perspective and I guess a bit of persistence, too. Both. Yeah. Our newest book is called Ask the Bridge from Your Dreams, Your Destiny. And we're saying absolutely you got to ask yourself, ask others, and then ask God. And you got to do that introspective thing. And because we have the world's biggest crisis, so we've also got the world's biggest opportunities, everyone has to re ask themselves who am I? What do I want to do? And what can I get paid substantially for right now? Because whatever number I give you is wrong, Martin. So I don't want to pretend, but whether it's 30% of the people or 50% that don't have the same job to go back to, we got to reinvent ourselves. We've got to pivot. We've got to reorient. Uh, re-innovate ourselves and it our minds are so bloody powerful if you just know the spiritual question we're asking is you say god what's your destiny for me that would be great pro greatly profitable and if you start asking the right question you get the right result right but it means that you've got to be introspective and, and many people find that quite difficult Totally. That's why we. That's why my wife Crystal and I did this book called Ask, because you got to learn to ask yourself. And if you don't know what to ask, we've got all the questions. Because we said, look, the people between that we met in eighty countries around the world that are nice, wonderful, professional, well educated, likable. The difference between a little success and vast success is one thing only. They have ad started to ask themselves. So we said, well, what did we ask ourselves when we were down and out and in adversity? to get back up and dust ourselves off, be resilient, and then decide to go onward, upward, and goodward again. And, and then we put that together, and then we interviewed the 26, what we call master askers in the world, and voila, it's starting to happen for everybody. Right, so there is actually a bit of a formulation, there is a bit of a sort of, a, if you like, a secret recipe of the, the things that people who are really successful do do versus those that don't. Exactly. When I was bankrupt, I, I finally came to the intuition, what do I want to do is I want to be a professional speaker. So I'm, I'm broke. I'm down. I've got no training. I go to my three roommates in Hicksville, Long Island, New York, and I say, do you know anyone that's young, not a celebrity, not a lawyer, not a doctor, not a famous person that's speaking? And the guy said, look, kid, here's a ticket. I'm a real estate. This guy's training everybody in Hawpog, Long Island, New York. Take my ticket. Tell him you're me and get in. He mesmerized the audience for three hours. I'd never seen anything like it. 
I go up to him at the end of the talk. I shake his hand and I say, Chip Collins, who became my best friend, teach me how to do the business. He said, look, chance of you making it is one in a thousand. You're not going to make it. But I'll tell you what to do if you stay out of my market. I'm, I'm real estate. and You can go do life insurance, but you're not going to make it. He told me what to do, what to say, how to do it. He came back from a two-week vacation. I had more talks and more books and bookings than he did. I did a thousand talks a year for the first three years. As far as I know, only Tony Robbins and I were wild men being taking massive crazy action and getting up before dawn and talking in the middle day and late day. And then somebody said, well, do you have those stories in a book? And I, my first little book I wrote was called Stand Up, Speak Out, Win. And I said, this is my bestseller. And everybody wanted me to sign it. And I was, I was in heaven. I tripled my income in one year. I sold 20,000 copies at $10 each, made $200,000. I thought Martin, I died and gone to heaven. I was enjoying myself. So, so what I'm saying is for everybody is that you got to, you got to come out of adversity and there's going to be new opportunities for each and every one of us. And I guess that's quite important because, you know, many people perhaps are now in the situation where the job that they had has disappeared or the hours that they've got available has really dropped. And of course, everyone's sort of hanging on and hoping that things will bounce back to where they were. But what I think you're saying is that, well, maybe that isn't actually the most uh, effective way of, of dealing with the current situation. Maybe rather than looking back, you should look forward and, and think about perhaps new opportunities and new potential. Yeah, because life happens inside out. Most people are saying, well, when I get the paycheck, when I have the estate, when I have the portfolio, no, 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 no. You decide you're going to have that inside and your whole world shifts. Some of you know about the law of attraction. You've seen my partner and partners in, in the secret movie. And you say, well, how does it work? Well, you got to decide in your heart of hearts and your soul of soul. I want to be a speaker. And then I was. Then I said, I want to be an author. And I was. Then I want to be a best-selling author. And then I said, well, I want to be a serial entrepreneur. And I, you know, I ran a hundred million dollar company with 387 employees. So, but it started inside and shows up outside. It doesn't show up outside and then so he's going, oh, please, Martin, work for me. Please, please. That isn't the way, at least my experience. Now, if you've got a different experience, I'm, I'm willing to listen to anything. But my experience, and I'm a Horatio Alger Award winner with some of the superstars of the universe, means I've come from rags to riches and been excessively philanthropic, is that every one of us had to overcome the odds. And everyone that's listening has to overcome the odds. But the first odds is the odds against yourself, because a lot of us self-sabotage. We we're in this book, we're writing seven things. You got to overcome so your lack of self worth. You got to overcome fear. You got to overcome disconnection. You got to overcome excuseology and that kind of stuff. And every one of us has multiple handicaps like that. And once you read it and look at it or listen on tapes or get it electronically or watch us on videos or whatever you do, you start to go, oh, that's me. With your permission, I'll give one quick example. Yeah, please do. We have a guy in the book that is a billionaire and a superstar in real estate, and, and he had us on a show to all of his employees around the country, America. And uh, I told the story about Bob Proctor, who's been to Australia a ton, like I have. I've been there a dozen times and love it. But he um, talked about his overcoming his lack of self-worth, and he was never feeling enough. And all of a sudden, this guy uh, says, Greg Hag, he said, I didn't see it. Oh, I see what you mean. Because you see you in another person's story. He said, I'm in eighth grade. I love the girl next door. My dad's name is Chubby. So I think I should be Chubby. So now he's a, a beanpole. He's about 6'2 and maybe weighs 140 naked when wet. But he's really skinny now. But he used to be Chubby. He said, in eighth grade, I was big as, as a house. I'm quoting. I'm not besmirching anyone's weight. And, and he said, I wanted to date the girl next door and take her to the eighth grade prom. And I told dad, Chubby, and Chubby said, well, go call her. And, and he said, every night the phone was big and red and ferocious looking. I couldn't make it. I never called her. And he said, the worst thing about having low self-worth is I lied to my father. And I never saw that until I heard you tell that story about Bob Proctor. And I said, what happened? He said, I told dad, I called her and she's going to a football player. I met her the next year and she said, I wanted to go with you. If you just asked, you were my next door neighbor. I thought the world of you. I didn't care about your weight. I cared about you as a person. And that's what low self-worth does. It diminishes us. And right now, this lockdown has diminished us, depressed us. Uh, some of us are furloughed. Some of us are stifled and stopped. 
And what we got to do is be careful not to believe it's going to go back. We got to re pivot. We got to reorient. We got to reinvent. And the way to do that is ask yourself, God, what is your destiny for me 400 times before you go to sleep? And when you wake up in the middle of the night with the answer, make sure you write it down instantly because all of us are instant forgetters. And you'll tell your spouse or your beloved or your sweetheart, oh boy, I had the idea last night and say, well, what is it? I don't know. Yeah, I just know I had it. No, no, you got to write it down. Get your little butt out of bed and, and write it down. Lock it. Does it make sense? <laughs> well, I certainly find that some of the best ideas I have are in the middle of the night, weirdly. But you, you, you touched on excusology, and, and I think that's quite really really quite important because i often see this with some of the people that i engage with through my surveys that they always make excuses there's always a reason why they don't do something or it's happened to them um is is that what you're getting at there exactly exactly i mean all look i said in 1974 when i went bankrupt and lost two million dollars in one day and i thought i was a hot shot i was living in new york city and having a good life and suddenly I couldn't get any product, so I went bankrupt because the oil embargo hit. I, I was, oh boy, poor me. And then dumb me, I read the New York Times. That's what I'm saying. You've got to change your own personal narrative, your own personal thinking, your own personal statements and start saying, I'm enough, I'm enough, I'm enough, I'm enough, I'm enough. I've got self-confidence. And if you don't believe you got self-confidence, believe that Martin and Mark believe you got untold unquenchable, unstoppable self-confidence and decide to go onward, upward, and good work. Yeah. So, you know, it comes back to attitude of mind. It comes back also, I suspect, to taking that first step and being prepared to risk because there are, of course, risks when you go down this path, isn't there? Totally. I just wrote something about that. First of all, your attitude gives you altitude in business and life, and I want everyone to ascend go up and high in altitude and attitude and then take the first step that's what Lao Tzu said the journey of a thousand miles becomes the first step and I just wrote something about push-ups because we had a few days holiday and and I met this guy who does 500 push-ups a day and I thought oh my gosh it always starts with one push-up and then two and then a couple sets of push-ups and now I'm building up to 500 which he does exceedingly fast I was just I was so blown away and this guy and I just really hit and we just bumped into each other literally at a hotel walking out of a restroom and started talking and he's doing great things and uh, you know he ended up buying lunch for my wife and I. I was with a bunch of other people but he said no no your books have helped me so I'm buying you lunch you don't need to do that but I said thank you and and we became best friends because when you're thinking positive you're going to meet the right people for the right reasons to get the right results right here right now it doesn't matter they got fired or furloughed or you got downsized or outsized or side-sized yesterday, there's something great waiting for you, but you've got to have the right attitude of mind to attract it. So you are the attractor factor, as they say. <laughs> yeah, and that's really a shift of uh, perspective, isn't it? Because effectively what you're doing is saying, actually, I am you know, more in control than I may think I am, that there are things that I can do. But many people will find that, really really tough that switch um so how do you actually make that switch well when i was bankrupt luckily i learned that you got to shut off the negative media 15 minutes a day is all you need to listen to about the disease that's going around and blah 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 and tune in and turn on whether you watch my stuff on youtube or somebody else positive that really gets it to you whether it's bob proctor or my stuff or pat Masidi's stuff there is great stuff out there for the first time or you start reading my books before you go to sleep, or somebody positive. There's so, there's, I mean, I can take you through a hundred books off the top of my head that I think everybody should read right now, because we're going into the most opportune time ever. And what I'll talk about with uh, Pat Masidi this weekend is, is we're going to do fifty trillion dollars in this decade from 2010 to 2020, with seven industries that are all nascent. They're all beginning. They're green pea industries, and one is. There's a company that spent $300 million to learn how to take all our trash. We all create five pounds of garbage a day, whether you want to or not. And we filled our landfills in your country. Well, your country's bigger than ours and emptier. But the bottom line is we can turn metal to metal, glass to glass, plastic to plastic. And in our country, we need 22 million employees right now. This company's trying to hire. And in your country, if you're 10% of our population ballpark, I'd say 2.2 million. So we're in a very brand new, exciting 
opportune time if you're awake. Now, if you're saying, well, I'm going to go back to where I was, you may not be going back. That's what you've been saying articulately during this interview. Absolutely. Well, you've mentioned the uh, the seminar, and uh, we'll put a link below. It's uh, mccity.com forward slash chicken soup, and it's uh, this Sunday, the 26th of July. And it's free, and Pat, who everybody knows is the probably the most renowned uh, prosperity speaker. I got to be careful. There may be somebody else in Australia, but uh, you know, Pat and I've been friends 30 years and I've always sat at his feet and just wondered the guy just, he waxes poetically. He is Shakespeare on the platform. He's just most abundantly magnificent and he illuminates people's minds, hearts, and souls to go out and be all that they can. So he's amazing. Well, I appreciate your, your time today. And, uh, you know, I think that the message from here is that people can take control, that there are things that they can do, but they have to think a little bit differently. And if they want to find more, they should listen to you at the weekend. Absolutely. We invite them and it's free. You can't beat the price. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today. Take care.